The number three House Democrat, Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina, is stepping into the Ohio congressional race. Yesterday, Clyburn endorsed Chantel Brown, the leading opponent of Nina Turner, an outspoken ally of Bernie Sanders and a current frontrunner in the race. In spite of the endorsement of her competition, Nina Turner and her campaign have seen a surge in fundraising from not just Ohio donors, but donors all across the country. Former National Press Secretary for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign and co-host of the Bad Faith podcast, Brianna Joy Gray, joins us now to weigh in on this. Welcome, Brianna. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Let's just start with a basic question. What do you make of Clyburn? I mean, it's, this is obviously not entirely out of character or unexpected from James Clyburn, but what do you make? How do you think this changes the race? Look, I think it's really benevolent for James Clyburn and Hillary Clinton and a lot of other corporate dims to be willing to do so much to fundraise for Senator Nita Turner. Because as we've all seen at the end of the day, every time one of these kind of establishment Democrat heavyweights comes out and endorses her opponent, she has an enormous fundraising day. And I think that is a real testament to the credibility that she's raised over the course of the last few years that she's campaigned for not just Bernie Sanders, but for the kinds of progressive issues that overwhelming majorities of Americans not only want, but really need at this crisis point. And Bri Brianna, we actually have numbers that, ju that just came in that, that make your point. Dave Weigel of the Washington Post is reporting that uh, after Hillary's endorsement, she, as we know, she raised more than $100,000 overnight. After James Clyburn's endorsement, again, more than $100,000. And so that's $200,000 pumped into Nina Turner's campaign by Clinton and Clyburn. The question is, what, what value uh, do those endorsements have for Chantel Brown? And, and I ask that because, as, as you recall, Elliot Engel got the endorsement of uh, Hillary Clinton and a whole slew of establishment Democrats uh, in, in the final few weeks of, of that race. Jamal Bowman is now representing that district and won it in a landslide. Hmm. Well, it's clear when you read reporting like the New York Times article about this recently that the goal is to show that all of the familiar names in the Democratic Party, the household names that you know and trust, are behind Chantel Brown. And moreover, the way that the Clyborne endorsement is being framed in particular is seemingly a little bit of a nod to a certain level of identity politics, which is interesting given that both candidates in this race are black and that Senator Turner has gotten so many endorsements from notable black public figures, including black and brown public figures, including all the members of the squad. Um, and so it's really curious to start to look closely at why it is that people like Jim Clyburn regularly are deployed to kind of run cover for establishment candidates. None of us can forget what happened in the Democratic primary where Clyburn coming out in favor of Joe Biden at the last minute really helped to swing South Carolina for Joe Biden, who up until that point had won zero states and was really flagging as a candidate. And so one has to start to ask the question, what are Jim Clyburn's motives here to get in the middle of, of these races over and over again? And you can't escape the fact that Jim Clyburn has taken more money from the pharmaceutical industry over the last 10 years than anybody else in Congress. Um, he comes from a state that has some of the worst health outcomes in the country. I believe it ranks number 44. It's the number two state in terms of me medical debt with almost 38 uh, percent, sorry, 32 percent of uh, South Carolinians having medical debt. Um, some of the worst outcomes in terms of uh, maternal health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these things are connected. And the idea that someone from a state like South Carolina that has Republican leadership, that is a red state that didn't get Medicare expansion, right, that didn't accept Medicare expansion would be working so hard against people who are working for a federal solution to the health care crisis in his own state um, is really frankly unethical. I, I don't know. I don't know what other word to use there. There's a, another interesting layer to this, which is the political one in which Clyburn's endorsement in South Carolina obviously was a productive one for Joe Biden. And it seems as though it's been counterproductive <laughs> for Chantel Brown, at least so far in the way that the Hillary Clinton one was. And as Ryan says, that $200,000, that's at least $200,000. That right, number will least. probably go up with other donors and maybe even big dollar donors who don't like the establishment. Um, Especially after um, this video goes up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so 
Brianna, I want to ask, though, did Clyburn's success in swinging that South Carolina race or, or changing the momentum in the South Carolina race speak to something about the nature of the Democratic electorate still being um, sort of different from the Bernie coalition alone, that there are still perhaps like white boomers um, and, and black boomers who have very different outlooks on some of these policy issues who are adverse to radical ideas, at least as they're sort of framed in the, in the mainstream media. Did it speak to that? And Will that play out again in this race? Well, first and foremost, we have to remember that Joe Biden won South Carolina because more white voters turned out than historically was precedented, right? Joe Biden won South Carolina on the backs of white turnout. Now, of course, an overwhelming majority of uh, black voters also voted for South Carolina in the state. And those voters overwhelmingly said that Jim Clyburn's endorsement was the dispositive factor for them. So you can't erase that reality either. But you also have to be careful to look at the fact that J Jim Clyburn is influential with voters. What Nina Turner is experiencing right now is an uptick in fundraising, something that Bernie Sanders also had no issue with. But she still has to make sure that she is convincing voters on the ground in Ohio who might, despite her ability to raise a, a large number of funds from across the country, from people who know and love her from the Bernie campaign, mm -hmm. um, might not have the same kind of traction in the state. Now, polls indicate that you know, Turner is actually polling very well in the state, which is why I think you're having this last minute uh, rush from these national corporate politicians to try to boost her opponent. I, I don't think that that's a real concern. My family happens to be from Cleveland, and she's been a household name for a long time, much longer than, frankly, Bernie Sanders has been a household name to them. But yes, I do think we have to keep our eye on the fact that what we're talking about here is a spike in fundraising, not necessarily what we saw in South Carolina, which was people who know Jim Clyburn, feel if can know Jim Clyburn and can trust Jim Clyburn and who followed his guidance on who to vote for in the in the presidential primary. And, and Brianna, how, how do we square the reality that that the, that the squad in general have been team players with Democrats <laughs> uh, for most of this term? And throughout the race, Nina Turner has not not said hardly a negative word about uh, Joe Biden. And like you said, she has a lot of establishment support and connections back at home. Yet you see this outpouring of corporate and establishment energy trying trying to crush her at the same time that uh, Hakeem Jeffries and a few others have formed a pack specifically dedicated to make sure that the squad doesn't grow. So how do we square these these two different realities? Well, I'm, for one, it's, it's cynical and it's, it's gross to see, but I'm, for one, am uh, glad that the corporate dims are finally um, showing their tuchus, as it were, and being pretty <laughs> open about the fact that they aren't this uh, majoritarian, you know, let's get behind the most popular candidate. We all have to come together and do a unity for the Democratic Party. All of the sloganeering that they use to try to corral people to vote for corporate candidates suddenly goes out the window when we're talking about an enormously popular progressive candidate. This isn't the first time we've seen this. It isn't the last time we're going to see it. But the more and more we see it, I think the more voters are going to realize that simply having a big D behind your name doesn't mean that it's a candidate or a party, frankly, that is going to fight for you in your interest. And I'm really glad, although obviously this creates more of a, an uphill battle for candidates in many instances, I'm really glad that voters are getting this real-time education about what the Democratic Party is willing to do that's antithetical to their interests as individuals, as a community, in particular as a, a voter voting community that has been through one of the most traumatic years in American financial and um, health history. And is being, and remember, they're seeing the very candidates that accurately um, represent the policies that poll after poll after poll show that Americans want a $15 minimum wage, universal health care, and on and on and on. We're seeing that the corporate, the Democrats are willing to define themselves as the party that's willing to do anything and everything to squash those interests. And hopefully voters will start to make very different choices going forward. And we have to leave it there. Brianna Joy Gray, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Washington Post economics reporter Jeff Stein joins us next. Stay with us.